Hello and welcome to the Upon Further Review podcast brought to you by Field Street Baptist Church. On this podcast, your host Cody Kitchen sits across the table from Dr. John Hall as he reviews his Sunday sermon from the week before. Welcome to Upon Further Review Podcast, the show that takes a deep dive into Pastor John Summers from the Sunday before. I'm your host, Cody Kitchen, and today we're talking about Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10, the urgent business of Jesus. And joined with me always is Dr. John Hall. Good afternoon, everyone. This is coming to you late because of our big old snowstorm that we've had. Texas just shut down completely. Yes, Texas is not <laughs> completely equipped to handle weather. You're but right. it has genuinely, genuinely been, been a rough series of days. It has been. The roads have been really bad. Been. Today wasn't as bad, so we thought we'd come in, record it, and we'll upload it today. So make sure you listen to the whole episode to find out what's stupid in our That Stupid segment. So let's get started. John, as you prepared this message from Sunday, what are some things that came to mind? First, just calling attention to... The reality and dynamic of the Lord's focus on and commitment to his divine mission Hmm. and the urgency about which he went about accomplishing the Father's will and work for his life. It's remarkable. I, I I just don't see in the Gospels any dawdling, any, hey, I'm just here marking time. Just hoping to get through another day. It, it, there was a real focus and sense of urgency about the Lord's work. He, he was very much aware of why he was here. That shouldn't surprise any of us, but maybe it's helpful to just have it brought to your attention from time to time. So that's the first thing that popped into my mind as I began to pour over that text of Scripture, just seeing the, the urgency of the Lord's mission and how he went about it with such deliberation (laughs) and intentionality. I think that'd be what I'd say was the first thought to pop in there. That's good. And on Sunday, you brought a sermon that outlined Jesus' mission here on earth. You make the point to show us that Jesus was, as you just said, deliberate and measured in doing his Father's will. In your first point that you brought to us is the Lord's urgent business involves spending time with sinners. And we see this in verse 5 of Luke chapter 19. And you make this strong appeal from scripture that Jesus had a great affection for sinners and spent time with them. Then he questioned those also in powerful positions. And we have this example in this passage that you brought to us with Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector who was detested by the Jews, the tax collectors were, and even others. And he had a a bunch of money that came from fraud and deception. This man was a sinner and was despised because of it. Yet, you point out, and Scripture even points out, Jesus in the story seeks out, seeks him out, and tells him he is coming to his house. So my question is, how important is it for us to make sure we are reaching out to unbelievers and not just our quote-unquote Christian friends. Right. Well, all of us, if we're not intentional about it, we'll find ourselves just tending to gravitate to people who are like us, who think like us, who share our values, share in this instance and context our belief in Christ and our commitment to Him. So it's just absolutely crucial that we discover ways to befriend those who are not yet followers of Jesus. And that takes a lot of intentionality. You have to be very deliberate. And I can say it just will not happen by chance or happenstance. You have to have that on your radar. You have to be thoughtful about it. For example, uh, years ago, I joined a racquetball club when we lived in Denver, Colorado. And... There were two reasons for that, really. One, I loved racquetball. (laughs) And two, it was the best way for me to be around people who were lost. Mm. And over the course of four years in living there, we we made lots of friends, or I made lots of friends, and then we got to be friends with with several couples, uh, Beth and I and 
and several couples out of those racquetball relationships. But uh, for me, it just provided a great natural avenue. Why not take something you love and and then play with other racquetball players and then ultimately those conversations get to points of interest that relate to the spiritual. Hmm. Especially if you're looking to do that and thoughtful about it, you know, hey, tell me where you go to church or do you have a relationship with Christ? Have you ever read the Bible? I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get into the conversation. Um, but it takes, you know, the planting the seed, watering it. And, right. And I've, I've said before to the church that I think evangelism is more like gardening, tending a garden, than the one and done hit and run kind of evangelism encounters. Although those are valuable as well, for me, I've had more fruitfulness from just befriending, remaining friends, making the effort, moving the conversation. It's it's not rocket science. It's just thinking to do it and to look at the relationships in your life where God has placed you and looking at those relationships in more of a way like, hey, this is my field and the harvest uh, this is the field that I'm supposed to be working. This is the vineyard that God has given to me. and I enjoyed that very much. Living in Denver, Colorado was kind of an eye-opening experience because you you could throw a rock in any direction and not necessarily hit a believer or a church. And so mm-hmm. I was around a lot of non-believers. Yeah, yeah it was interesting. Loved it. Um, but through the years, over the course of time, the Lord... Uh, really blessed those relationships and gave us opportunities to share our faith. And I think we won't share our faith unless we're, you know, making the effort to do that. That's good. Because everybody's busy with life and taking care of your family and going to work and, you know, keeping a home and all the things that demand our time and attention. And all those are good things, but in reality, if we're not purposeful about engaging lost people, we won't. So I, that's my encouragement to all yeah. of us. And I, I, I hate to use myself as an example, but it's only it's the only example I have because I, you know, and I'm not suggesting you move to Denver to start <laughs> being a witness. We can all do that here in Cleburne, and you know, whether the person who cuts your hair, the server at the restaurant, uh, someone you may see frequently and develop a relationship with, over time you can move those conversations to matter of the spiritual and certainly about Jesus Christ, but it won't happen if you are not purposeful and urgent about it. That's good. That's a good encouragement of being purposeful in it and thinking about it, because I think a lot of us just move on with life and don't think about it, mm-hmm. that we're okay with the friends we have and we're good with that. And um, it's a wrong with right. Christian friends. I mean, I think we should, but it's not either or it really is kind of both and I mean we are the agent of the Lord now we're his church and so we have to penetrate the world in which we live and it does take building relationships which takes time and purposefulness absolutely and that's what's so unique that's what I was going to say so unique about Christ's ministry is that he spent time with his quote unquote friends the disciples loved on them encouraged them but as you pointed out on Sunday something he did so master, masterfully and perfect was even hanging with those that everyone despised. And yeah. he and encouraged them, he loved them, and obviously, as we'll see through that story, pointed them to salvation. Yeah. And I think that's, as you were saying and what you were talking about, that encouragement for all of us is just to think about what are ways can we do that. And the racquetball story is a great story of the things that we do in our everyday life. We have an opportunity um, to meet people mm-hmm. and that aren't just in our circle of church friends, which again, we're not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, yeah. but what are we doing to reach out for sure? Yeah, and it, it, again, it's helpful to hear, and probably we all need to hear it repetitively. You, you have to be purposeful about it. Mm-hmm. it. It won't happen by accident. Yeah, that's good. Uh, another thing I'd like to throw in, if I may, um, I brought this out of the sermon Sunday, but I, when I read the gospel accounts, it is fascinating to me that that the, the holiest man who ever graced the mm. face of the earth was not repulsive to sinners. There was something about Jesus that sinners found appealing. Mm. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, you everyone who's listening to this 
probably should stop and think, what was it about Jesus that sinners found compelling? And, and you're going to have to come up with your own answer. Now, it doesn't need to be some wild answer that doesn't align with Scripture, but I think there are answers to that question that we should look at and say, am I incorporating that into my life? Do, do people who who don't go to church or don't have a relationship with Jesus, do they, if they're friends with me, do they like me? That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please don't email me any answers. <laughs> nah, no one would. <laughs> yeah, <they do>. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, your second was the Lord's urgent business involves saving the lost. And we see that in verse 10. And you direct us to this verse where Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Which I love that verse. And you make the point once again that Jesus knew his mission and that Zacchaeus would know salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus showed us what salvation looks like through Christ. So my question is, as believers, how can we practice what Jesus did and share his gospel message? And I I know it's kind of a maybe seem like it's a repeat from the last question, but really specifically, how can we share the gospel and how can we incorporate that into our, our lives? Right. It, it may be just an expansion on what we've already talked about, but uh, building friendships with the unsaved, mm-hmm. and I think we all should do that. Uh, there are people that I can relate to that you can't, and there are people you relate to that I cannot. And I think God puts us where he wants us. That's all determined by his sovereign hand. I'm here in Cleburne, Texas, because God put me here. And so here's my field of work. And just in part, you know, asking God to renew your vision for what you see in front of you and taking those opportunities you know, it cracks me up sometimes. Like, oh, Lord, give me the opportunity to witness to someone. Mm. And I just think, don't you think God's up there going, I do all the time. <laughs> Open your eyes. It's good. I, I'm putting this in front of you. And so building those relationships. I think it, it it's utterly essential because we're relational people. And so really it's going to be rare that someone can be one to Christ from an unfriendly person. You know, an unfriendly yeah. ambassador and, and minister of reconciliation. So there has to be a, a commitment to you know be friendly, be conversant, be be alert and observant to the people around you, or even more purposeful. Like you know, I'm going to go to this person and for the next ten years. They're going to cut my hair. Yeah. I'm going to build a relationship with them, even if I have to suffer through a few bad haircuts. <laughs> All of us do. But am I going to? You know, is it more important to me to befriend them, talk with them about matters of spirit? And you're going to hear some things that will make you, you know, just, oh, boy, look what I got myself into. But that's what we're really called to do. So, again, I think the most practical thing any of us can do is just be purposeful about it and start looking for those opportunities because they are everywhere. And, and you see enough people regularly that you can start forging those relationships. It's good. Like, I'll just give you an example. And I, can't, I hate that's from my life, but uh, there's a guy that waits on me at one of the local auto parts stores, and we've gotten to be friends. And the reason I go, I could probably get some of these uh, these parts for my car cheaper, <laughs> but I've, I've, I know him by name now. He knows me by name, and I can actually call the store and just start talking. And he knows who I am. You know, and again, it's just, it's nothing more than just, okay, I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to try this and do this. You know, sometimes it really works great. And sometimes it doesn't. But it's the, it's being like Jesus. You know, and he stopped and addressed him hmm. by name. Come down and we're going to your house today. And That's I'm going to have fellowship with you. And it drove the religious wild. And you better be prepared for that too. You know, if some if you make some friends with someone that the religious community would deem, you shouldn't be friends with them. Brace yourself for that. Mm. 
That's good. But you got Jesus as an example. I mean, I, I'm not a, suggesting in any way, nor is the scripture, that we adopt a lifestyle of someone who's lost. It's not right. all what we're to do. But we can still be friends with people and still speak truth to them. The Bible says, speak the truth in what? Love. Yeah. And so when people see over a period of time, we're not coming at them to judge their sin, but I really want to introduce you to the one who saved me from my own sin. Yeah. That's really good. And coming from a point of, as you've even said, the question before, of just a relationship standpoint. And there's a church member in our church that I've admired and that just, I think there's a lot of them, but this one in particular, just the way that he has come to me before and says, hey, I just want you to know I had this conversation, more of a follow-up than it was a, hey, I want you to know what I'm doing. In the way, and I've even witnessed him creating this relationship and and even sharing the gospel and just the way that he does it. Sure, you can say that he's practiced, whatever. But my point in that is that he takes every opportunity that's given to him to at least share that there's something different about yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's not rocket science. It's right. just doing it, and some people are really, really good at it. I mean, I'm amateur hour, mm-hmm. and I just, Lord, please help me and give me the words to say and how to get it, you know. And, and then sometimes, too, to be honest, you know, I'm in a hurry, too. Yeah. You know, so it's the, when the text says Jesus stopped and looked up in that tree, <laughs> Now, I think it was providence, but the fact that the Lord did that, and I'm going to take the time to go to your house today. Yeah, And I know I'm going to take it on the chin from my contemporaries, but salvation's coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. Mm. And we see that in the, you know, the fruit of his conversion, which I know we're going to talk about, but again, and I have to, I'm reminding myself more than anything, just being intentional about it, because I get busy and distracted yeah. and and I'm on my way to point B, just like everybody else. And just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean it just comes easily and right. naturally and just rolls off my tongue. I struggle like everybody else does. Yeah, and I think that's a good point and a reminder of hopefully as the listeners, you hear this as the challenge is that we continue to be mindful of what the calling is. And that's what spoke to me so much, I think, on Sunday was just that reminder of being mindful and being in um, – ready for those opportunities and creating opportunities too and not just waiting as you said in the beginning of this prayer of okay god give me opportunities Um, but that they're all around us and what are we doing to to take those opportunities and not to prolong what we were already saying but i've been on the i'm sure i guess technically we've all been on the flip side of salvation when we haven't been saved but i remember when i worked in the uh, uh, customer service industry for so long and as a waiter and at this point, I was saved, but remember a table specifically and a man who shared the gospel with me. And I listened to it like I haven't heard it before. And after he was done, I just thanked him and told him, I am saved. And I want you to know how much I appreciate that you took the time out of your 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 dinner with your wife to share this. And so I think it's, I'm sharing that to say, I think it just takes, you could tell that this man was calculated in what he was saying. He, that's what he was going to do from the beginning. Yeah, he, and had, he had an agenda. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, yeah, at least it starts there with that kind of, man, I'm going to, even if it's something like, hey, um, we're about to pray over our meal, hmm. and is there anything we can pray for you today? That's good. And they may take you up on it. Nine times out of ten, they won't. Sometimes they will. And, man, it's, you never know how the Lord is going to use all of that. So our job is just, you know, do the work. And the Lord's responsibility is to bring whatever fruit he wants from that work. But we have to do the work. That's good. That's very good. And going on to the the third point, you said the Lord's urgent business involves seeing the fruit of conversion. And we saw this in verse 8. And we see this, and you brought it out to us on Sunday, this conversion of Zacchaeus. And you tell us that the proof of salvation is the fruit of conversion. He, he had a change of heart, Zacchaeus did, and a change of perspective. He was willing to give back what he had taken from others. He was willing to give it four times, I believe is what it was in, in, in what we read. And he did this as a result of his salvation. 
and because of what Jesus had done in his life. And so I guess for me, the question becomes, well, how can we allow the conviction of the spirit in our lives to change us? Yeah, it's obvious that that he has responded. Hmm. And he changed. There was a conversion. It certainly appears to me from the way the text is worded because he said, anyone I cheated, I will repay them fourfold. That was a big chunk of money. And then he said, I'll give what I have to the poor, help the poor too. So he, his life was changed on several levels. And I think it's interesting that what, what the fruit of his conversion that we know of in the scripture was how it affected his perspective on his money. Hmm. So that's interesting. That is interesting. Um, but I, I think, you know, there has to be this openness and obviously a, a humility in recognizing that the Spirit must do His work in the new believer to bring about, you know, the, the regeneration, being born again, and then the evidence of that new birth is a change. And Zacchaeus changed, at least from, you know, the text point of view. Right. Like, Lord, those I cheated, I will... I will make restitution. I will repay them fourfold. You know he cheated that time. Hmm. They all did. You know, we're assuming, you know, tax collectors are like, you got sinners, then you have tax collectors. So they had like a <laughs> class of de- detestation. So I think his declaration to the Lord was significant in giving evidence of his heart had had a change. Yeah. And it, it, it was evidenced by his pocketbook. I wonder how much that applies to all of us. <laughs> you really know if you've changed, if you're willing to look at your money different. That's good. If you're willing to get, you know, give it. Uh, you're willing to hold on to it loosely. Hmm. You know, do you, has, has your conversion affected other areas of your life but not your wallet? Probably all of us should think about that some. Hmm. But if it's, if it's getting to your wallet, it's probably getting to other areas of your life as well because that's a really key part and component of our lives. That's good. You can't function in our society without money. But the Christian has to view money differently than the man of the world. So the man of the world says, you know, get all you can and get it any way you can. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. My Father will meet your needs. You have to look at your money differently. Mm. You know, you're like, I'm going to ask you to give it away. I'm going to ask you not to think of it as the most important priority in your life. And I want you to have a kingdom perspective on stewardship, remembering that God owns it all, and you're just a caretaker of it. That's, good. That's not what the world teaches us. So no wonder we're always in conflict with the world's values and the kingdom values. Yeah. And they, they don't <coughs> necessarily run on parallel tracks. So brace yourself. If you're going to commit yourself to Christ, it it should and must impact how you view your your money. Hmm. That's a good point. Just lost a lot of listeners. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting too. You know, we through this text for sure. But even as you read, and even in Jesus's ministry in Luke, we see that the Spirit is also active in in the conviction, in that conversion. He's active in. And that's what brought about the change. And, and so I, I just find it so interesting. And I think in the life of even believers who have already had that conversion, I think sometimes we purposefully, maybe not purposefully, ignore the conviction of the Spirit. And I think this is a, a perfect picture of what it looks like. Of Yes, this is talking about conversion coming, away, you know, not knowing Christ to Christ, but I think also a good picture of what it looks like to act on conviction when we are convicted and what, what that looks like. And yeah, and adding to that, if there's no change, I, you know, I, I, I just can't find any example in Scripture where someone gave their heart to Christ and professed belief in Jesus and declared Him as Lord where there wasn't a change. Hmm. And so we, there has to be a change. I mean, a person who says, well, Jesus is my Savior, and they don't change anything. They do whatever they want, whenever they want to do it. They're still selfish and sinful and still embrace a lifestyle that's godless. Hmm. I'm not convinced based on what the scripture teaches that conversion has come to that person's heart. So 
all of us have to evaluate, am I, di- am I different because of my relationship with Christ? And am I the man I used to be? I certainly hope not. Yeah. And, and the evidence is in the fruit of our conversion. And the Spirit, as you're pointing out, works to bring conviction and works to produce fruit from our lives that bears testimony that we are in Christ. Yeah. That's all through the Bible. And I'm not making that up. It, go check it out for yourself. But there's plenty of scripture that teaches us that we're not saved by works, but works give evidence and proof of our salvation. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So faith without works, James says, it's dead. Yeah. That's good. And because it's so good, what are some of your final thoughts? Give us some last <laughs> words. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Um, Really, this is a, a message that has you know, relevance for all of us to think about the, our own sense of urgency about how we're going about our own lives. I celebrated a birthday last week, so I'm another year old, mm. another year on the rock. <laughs> and I, I, I know that more years are behind me now than are in front of me. And it does kind of, you know, influence what do I really want to do with my life? whatever days I have left. It's a shame you have to get to in your 50s before you start thinking mm. about it in a more sober way. But I think you're you're more confronted with the reality of your own mortality. Right. I mean, I wasn't thinking about dying when I was in my 20s. And I was just like going with my hair on fire. Mm. Mach 8. <laughs> just trying to get out of school, get my education, you know, marriage and family and all those things that occupy our time, which are all good, many of them, if not all of them, given to us by God. Mm. So reclaiming that sense of why am I here and am I expending my life in a way that honors God more consistently than not. So that's a challenge for all of us. That's so good. Uh, thank you for all for all the input, John, and all your wisdom, <laughs> well. for sure. And definitely was a good sermon on Sunday. And One I think we all need to be reminded of. So thank you. Well, guys, on to everyone's favorite segment, where we tell you what's stupid. John, what's stupid today? Okay, well, we heard this week that Tom Brady Hmm. announced his retirement. The GOAT. For the second time. And this time he said, it's for good. What's fascinating about Tom Brady is... The newspapers are reporting that during his professional career as a a professional football player, he made $512 million. $512 million. That's wild. And he's had an offer, I believe, from Fox to be a broadcaster for NFL Fox games uh, to the tune of like $350 plus million. It's ridiculous. So he will make more than half of what he made in his professional football career as a broadcaster of football. I just think it's indicative of the world we live in mm. where a man who is exceptional as an NFL quarterback, a professional athlete, makes that kind of money. And then we have people who are teaching our kids mm. who, you know, who are barely scratching out a living. And I just think our our society's value system is all messed up. And I find it many days stupid. This does not make sense to me. Um, perhaps there should be a little more I'm not saying equity because I realize I don't I don't understand all the time and hours and effort a professional athlete puts in to be great at especially the level he's great. Sure. But come on, man. It, it's something's out of whack when we don't pay our public educators like we should. Yeah. Anyway, I don't, I'm not trying to get on a soapbox here, but I just find it stupid that he's going to make that kind of money as a broadcaster that's over half or more what he made in his entire professional career. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit that to you as that's pretty stupid. That's pretty I mean, stupid. Good for him because we live in a capitalistic society and he took advantage of it. Absolutely. And the market dictated all that. Now, you got to love America. But wow, sometimes our values are just messed up. And, and surely we can all look at that and go, 
man, good for him, but really? You're right. That's kind of stupid. It is very stupid. And it, look at our culture today and the yeah. ones our education system's brought up, and it tells you the reason why. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just a little wonky. It is a little wonky. Me, but, you know. That's stupid. Yeah, I think it's stupid. Absolutely. You know, tip of the hat to him. Congratulations on his phenomenal uh, career. I'm sure he's listening. And so we want to be sure and express our well wishes to the man. Um, I wish him well. You know, I want him to come to know Christ. And, and man, the platform he could have if he ever came to know Jesus as his Savior would be phenomenal. So we'll see. You know, we'll keep praying for the man. Thanks for joining us. And to end the session, remember, make Christ known by what you say and how you live. Have a great week. Thank you all for listening. And be sure to subscribe to Upon Further Review so you never miss an episode. If you have any questions, please be sure to reach out to us at info at fieldstreet.com. Thanks for tuning in.